So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Ling Ching and I'm the President and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade. And I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight to launch the 11th 12th issue of Capital Magazine. This is a magazine that we uh, co-publish uh, with the Gordon Group uh, in, for the business community of Ottawa to cover themes that are of importance to Ottawa. So uh, we had no choice really but to speak to the current pandemic and our recovery and how that's affecting our community and our business in this issue. And the issue is entitled Leadership and Collaboration Igniting Our Economy. So all of our members, sponsors, and contributors will be receiving their hard copy. And hopefully all of you have seen our social media links to the um, online copy at capitalmag.ca. There are some fantastic contributors in that magazine, some of which are joining us here tonight. But before we get started with uh, a few of our speakers, I wanted to welcome Minister Marilee Fullerton, who is taking a few minutes out of her uh, time at Cabinet to join us here. And Marilee, I just wanted to turn it over to you as one of the contributors in the magazine uh, to say a few words of greeting. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's communities that uh, you're creating uh, through the work that you do uh, that brings people together in a time of need like this. And so, you know, we see people working so hard in their businesses, building up their businesses, putting their blood, sweat and tears into them. And, uh, and then come, comes along COVID. But there is hope, there is resilience. And if we look back at our ancestors, they were resilient. Uh, we can be resilient. We'll find the path forward. And uh, I, I, I don't want to dismiss anybody's concerns, the challenges that they're having right now, but we will get through this, we'll get better. And I just want to, again, mention the importance of building communities and relationships and partnerships, which is what you're all doing um, to get us through this. We need that more than ever. And uh, so thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, uh, Minister Fullerton, for your leadership here in Ottawa and within the, um, the government in Ontario. So we really appreciate you being here and your ongoing partnership and collaboration. I've said this many times, um, what an incredible level of collaboration between the government and the, and the community and the business community during this time. So we thank you very much for being here. And so I see that Minister McLeod has also been able to join us. Welcome, Minister McLeod. Uh, thanks, Ling. Yes, and so uh, I know that both you and uh, Minister Fullerton are busy with Cabinet, so we're really grateful for you to be here. And I know that you have spoken at our launches in the past. Usually we have some wine and appetizers, <laughs> and uh, we're able to see each other in person. Uh, but uh, we're pleased to be able to do this virtual event and I wondered if you might like to say a few words of greeting today as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, as as Marilee said, uh, we're just both popping off of uh, cabinet. Uh, Marilee, I just texted uh, the chair of cabinet, Vic Fidelli, just wanted to pass on how awesome we are. So we're really excited about that. Uh, look, uh, Marilee was right. Uh, this has been a very tough uh, slog, very tough for her as Minister of Long-Term Care, obviously, um, and very tough for me as the Minister responsible for heritage, sport, tourism, and culture industries, which were hurt, uh, hit first, hardest, and will take the longest to recover. Uh, we uh, have been working nonstop as a government. I believe we're now at about 150 cabinet meetings since COVID-19, um, taking this obviously um, very seriously this is uh the fight of our lives it's it's uh, the war that uh we have to battle and uh and it's been very difficult um that said we've seen a lot of resiliency particularly in my sectors that i'm very proud of uh i was just out the other day for example with mark saunders who is a prominent businessman in the city of ottawa who's taken the ottawa countryside to, to new levels and new heights and is opening a christmas uh a christmas uh market uh, this uh, this summer or sorry this winter and uh, so he's been able to pivot and I've, I've been seeing that across uh, the province and certainly throughout our city and I think uh, the commitment to support uh, local initiatives and hyper local marketing and uh, of course next year we'll be having the year of the staycation and Ottawa will feature prominently in that um, 
I see Dr. Etch is, is on the line as well, and I don't see my uh, other two colleagues but um, from the federal government, but I can say uh, there has been unprecedented uh, collaboration between all levels of government and all of our collective agencies. And um, Meryl Lee may have said this before I popped on, but we're very fortunate that uh, she and I have the opportunity uh, each week uh, to sit down with uh, Dr. Etches virtually, as well as uh, the Queensway Carleton Hospital that serves our community, as well as the Ottawa Hospital, uh, just to, to, to monitor the healthcare situation. I've said repeatedly throughout this uh, pandemic that we're facing not one crisis, but three. Uh, we're facing a triple threat in the sense that we have a um, a public health crisis, we have an economic crisis, and dealing with the sectors I deal with, we're dealing with a social crisis. And um, encouraging people to go back to their uh, pre-COVID-19 behaviors in a post-COVID-19 world is gonna be a very big challenge. And so uh, that's why within my ministry, we're working on a five-year strategic plan in the next few weeks. Uh, we'll be coming out with a white paper to talk about the impacts that COVID-19 and this economic crisis have had on our sectors to see how we can best plan out of this. My, my goal and uh, certainly the efforts of my team has been to position Ontario um, and our gateway cities and in particular Ottawa and Toronto uh, for success uh, through the recovery phase um, in a number of different areas, including in tourism. Uh, we're advancing a new um, and I think enhanced product post COVID-19 that sees Ontario as a 365 year round destination. A big player in that uh, strategy as we move forward will be Michael Crockett of um, Ottawa Tourism. Uh, the second thing is we, we recognize that we have uh, a great opportunity in film, television, and animation production. Uh, Ottawa actually hosts the largest uh, animation festival in all of North America, and so we want to continue uh, to, to move forward on that in our city, uh, but I think we're particularly well uh, suited and well placed in a post-COVID-19 reality uh, for growth in those sectors. Uh, they traditionally are about a $1.9 billion suite of uh, industry um, we believe we can we can grow that. We're now at about 2.1 billion. Um, but given what we've seen in the states with social unrest, as well as their inability to contain COVID-19, uh, we've seen over 50 productions wanting to uh, to move and migrate uh, north, and in particular to Ontario. And uh, that is great news for the city of Ottawa and our countryside, where a number of these films are being produced. So we do have a great opportunity there. Um, and of course, in sport, sport hosting is a major. Um, economic driver in Ontario. I'll be making a, a big announcement tomorrow in our city uh, with Mayor Watson uh, about uh, about a big uh, event that's coming to our city. Uh, but we're looking at, uh, we're going to be focusing big in the province and uh, looking at the Commonwealth Games, the FIFA World Cup. What does that mean for uh, not only uh, the, the provincial capital, but what does it mean for our uh, communities across the province? And how do we encourage, um, you know, practices? Uh, how do we encourage uh, scrimmage games? That sort of thing in uh, in uh, our other co uh, communities and we know for example every time this ministry invests one dollar into festivals and events when it's safe to do so we generate about 21 dollars back so um, a lot of people think we're about grants and giveaways no we're about strategic investments in communities and making sure uh, that we grow that spectacular double bottom line that i always talk about our pride of people and pride of place and that cultural fabric and identity piece is very important but we are a big economic driver and i'll just finish on this um, I often say with our spectacular double bottom line, we generate about $75 billion towards the province's GDP. Um, that's larger than Manitoba's GDP and it's larger than the combined economic imprint of the Ministry of Finance, sorry, Forestry, Agriculture and Mining put together. Um, it's also larger than the GDP of Costa Rica. So uh, what we have to offer um, is really important. That's why it's really important right now that we move to save it. And so uh, I've been really fortunate to be able to work with so many talented women and you think about this, like the five women you have on your cover, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this, um, your chief medical officer of health, a female, the two federal ministers um, for our city, uh, the only two federal ministers for our city, female, and then your two provincial ministers, the only two uh, provincial ministers for the city, um, both female. So I think this has been a really great uh, experience for us with this, with this magazine cover, uh, just to demonstrate that uh, in COVID-19, uh, leadership has taken um, all different forms, um, but in this particular case with the political uh, leadership as well as the, the healthcare leadership, um, it's been by women. And so I think today is, is about shattering lots of glass ceilings um, and 
and it is, I think, a bright light in a very dark period in all of our lives. So, Su Ling, I also want to congratulate you for taking on the leadership of the Board of Trade, and uh, and as, as a strong female leader yourself, um, I think uh, it's just bidding that we were all able to be together on that, um, but we must always remember all the people that we're fighting for, and it is those people that are in long-term care, it is the people on the ventilator at the hospital, it is the, the, the frontline workers, um, from our assessment centers to our hospitals, uh, to our grocery stores, to our, our sanitation department, and, and it's all the people that we're fighting for, uh, for their small businesses to succeed um, post COVID-19. So I'm just really grateful to be part of this and uh, wanna thank you with all my heart uh, for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and my assistant is here wow. probably saying she spoke way too fast. <laughs> I, just no. gave you a, I just gave you a 20 minute speech in a five, five minute well, period. Well done. <laughs> That's, that's what we're about, getting it done. I appreciate everything you said, and I just want to say, you know, your ministry is so incredibly important to the economic growth and the recovery of our community and our province. And um, we're just thrilled that even though we are still facing a lot of challenges in that industry, that you are not letting that stop you and that you are approaching it with long-term visioning and leadership. And, uh, and so I know that we have a bright future ahead of us. And the thing about tourism too, is not just what the economic spinoff is, but, and Michael Crockett gave me this line, is that it is a gateway to all other things, including, you know, a business attraction and visitor relocation or, or, or residential relocation. So when people visit us, they start to think about us in other contexts as well. So thank you for your leadership, and I and I agree with you. It was it was nice to do the cover with so many women leaders, and I know David appreciates <laughs> equity <laughs> as well. And uh, but it's the passion that the both of you have demonstrated, as well as Vera and many of the other leaders, uh, that has made this you know has been the bright side of this challenge and uh, and keeps us going. So I really appreciate you being here and all the work that you're both doing. And I know that you both have to get back to cabinet. So you're welcome to stay, obviously, but we understand you have to go. Thank you Thank so you. much and all the very best to you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks all of Thank us. You. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank Take you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So one of the key leaders that has uh, taken us through these last few months and allowed our business community to thrive as much as possible has been our Chief Medical Officer at the Ottawa Public Health. So Dr. Vera Etches has joined us here today and I just want to introduce her by saying that we have been so impressed with your leadership but also your level of communication and collaboration during this time and really helping us amplify this idea that, uh, that managing COVID has to be balanced with the economic impacts as well as the mental health impacts uh, that we see in our community. So we appreciate you being here tonight as well, Vera, and uh, I would love to, if you had a few words that you would like to share with our, with our audience. The most important thing is to say thank you um, because all of you as employers have been protecting the health of your employees, of your clients or your customers. Uh, you've been doing things with that in mind and it really makes a difference. Uh, you know, you can see uh, when everyone across our city, a million people uh, and you know, employers leading the way, leading the way on mask use, all of these things is really helping. Um, absolutely, that uh, engagement to me is something will continue. It's very valuable. I, I can't make the best decisions without, uh, you know, understanding the impact on the economy as much as possible. Um, of course, I don't have all the power to make all of the decisions that affect things, right? We're in, in a provincial environment, but I want to understand uh, so that I can advocate where it's needed um, for that balanced approach. and. Um, yeah, so that's, I'm committed to that, that continuing engagement. I think um, we are fortunate to be able to see the vaccines coming, um, but we have a ways to go. And so I think that stability, that consistency through the winter is going to be key. And I just want to thank you for it. Thank you. 
I know one of the messages that we've been working together on is this idea that we have to learn how to live with COVID so that we can keep moving forward, but doing it in a safe way. And is there something um, that you want to say to our community in general as we approach what we know will be a difficult season for us in Ottawa um, at, at the winter season? Uh, it is about making these uh, actions that are very basic, uh, haven't changed um, just part of our day, the routine around the masks, around the keeping two meters from others, uh, keeping to our households as much as possible. Um, I know that gets hard uh, with the, the challenge that we have you know, we haven't been able to hug our friends and, and through some very challenging times. So, you know, we're, all, we're aiming for as much as we can, the best we can do. I would say um, it, it is those, those blind spots, those when we're, we're um, in the lunchroom, uh, we continue to see these gaps. Uh, and so the more we can, you know, uh, keep our guard up, uh, make things routine uh, through the winter, uh, we'll, we'll see us uh, through. Thank you, Dr. Etches. And one of the most inspiring things that I think I've heard you say before is that, you know, even though we're doing things differently, there's still lots of opportunities for us to make memories uh, in this environment. And so we really hope that everyone is able to do that through this season. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity now to uh, introduce uh, the founder and the CEO of Abacus Data, David Coletto. Um, as I said earlier, David is, um, is a pillar in our business community. We've been working with him for many years on our annual business growth survey. You will often see him quoted in uh, national papers for his work. And uh, we're thrilled that he's just joined our own uh, board of directors as well this year. And we're going to enjoy working with David um, in the coming months as we serve the, or years as we serve at the business community. So David, welcome and thank you for joining us here tonight. Uh, thanks to Lynn and, and Melanie for, for having me. And uh, I'm super excited to be working with you on the board. This is, I guess, my first kind of official mm -hmm. uh, duties as board member, but also uh, I've got some, some data to share. So um, let me get into it. And I'm from my office here in Ottawa. It is completely empty, so Dr. Etches uh, will be very happy to see we we, we encouraging our staff uh, and team to, to work from home uh, as much as possible. I've come in the office today, and it's quiet and lonely, but <laughs> I know why we're doing it, so it's really important. But um, I think I think you know what we've heard already this evening. I think reflects both the challenges that Canadians and Ontarians and Ottawa residents are feeling, and also to some extent the opportunity that exists. And I'm going to share a little bit of data just to give you an update um, on on how the country's feeling right now. And as you can expect, we've entered a, a much more challenging period over the last eight months with the second spike in, in numbers of cases that corresponds with how people feel about things. So as, as, we, as we react to events, we see significant changes. So I'm just gonna quickly uh, share a few data points uh, with everybody to give you a sense of, of how Canadians are feeling about this. And, and just to give you context that Ontario and, and Ottawa in particular, you know, I don't think differ too much um, from the national average on many of these things. We've been tracking public opinion on the pandemic since day one. Uh, we've done probably interviews with maybe now 100,000 um, or, or about Canadians over that period. And, and so we got a really good sense of, of what's happening. And one of the questions we've been asking from the beginning is, over the past week, are you getting more or less worried uh, about the pandemic? And you can see in this tracking from, from mid-March all the way till today, that red line is the one that is most concerning. It's the one that tells us people are getting more worried. And so as of today, we just finished the survey this morning, 53% of Canadians say they're getting more worried about this over the last week. It's not as high as it's been, but it's still close to that high watermark. And you can see really since September, um, it's been quite elevated. And that corresponds almost entirely with the rise in cases in, in different parts of the country. And now that we see um, in many parts uh, a significant increase, that that, that number is going to continue to grow. But, the value of all this data, whether you're a business owner, whether you're a, 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 an employer and a manager, whether you're a government public policymaker, is that public opinion, as Dr. Etches will know, 
often might predict people's behavior. So, you know, whether it's uh, their comfort level going to the Rito Center, or it's their concern about venturing outside their home, or whether or not they're going to make that extra trip to the grocery store or not that they may not need to do, that if the fear of getting the virus, if the, the, the understanding that their decisions make a difference um, are internalized, that's going to ultimately affect their behavior. Now, when we look at this, this momentum of worry across the country, we see that in every part of the country now, whether you're in Atlanta, Canada, which has had you know, very low numbers of cases, although they're starting to move up, um, even despite sort of the Atlantic bubble that they had in place for this entire period. Um, Alberta, which for a while wasn't as worried as other parts of the country, now has you know, the largest number of per capita cases we see across the country. So at the very least, Canadians are united in, I think, a general concern about this pandemic and the fear that it is getting worse. And another measure that we've been tracking is the sense that is the worst still to come or is the worst behind us? And there was a point this spring and summer where majority of the country were at least somewhat optimistic that we had crossed uh, kind of the threshold of this being uh, uh, sort of getting worse. We might be seeing a return now that we've got news of vaccines potentially on the horizon. I know in Ottawa, we're feeling a little better, not, not complacent, but that our numbers might be you know, uh, under control or we're, we're, we're sort of uh, flattening the curve a little bit, but still half the country believe the worst is still to come. And that is a defensive posture um, from, from Canadians saying, I'm not ready yet to say that this is all gonna be good and we're ready to move on. So what does that mean? Well, for Dr. Etches and her colleagues in the health community, we have seen substantial increases in those concerned about the capacity of the system itself. So in the early days of the pandemic, huge spikes in these numbers, right? When this first started, people's focus was on, can our system handle what could be an incredibly large wave of cases putting pressure on our system. After that wave didn't materialize maybe as, as large as some people feared, that concern in June particularly dropped down. But we've now seen a spike again, where we hear stories about Manitoba, for example, having to shift beds uh, that were for outpatients now to intensive care for, for COVID-19 uh, patients coming in. So this fear that our system is going to be increasingly put under pressure. Now, this looks like bad news, but in another way, it's, it's good news because if we fear these kinds of secondary effects of the pandemic, it might start affecting our behavior, right? We start to make choices that protect us, protect our colleagues, protect our friends, protect our neighbors. And so this is all connected. Obviously for businesses, um, you know, Minister McLeod talked about the tourism, uh, heritage, hospitality sector that's been heavily hit. There's many Canadians right now today that say they are still fearful that their job will disappear. One out of four Canadians um, say that they're concerned that that might happen. Four out of 10 are worried about their long-term financial situation. That's up slightly from June. And you can see that even their ability to pay their bills over the next few months is up slightly. And I always been saying this, this pandemic from an economic perspective has really been one of almost two worlds, right? There's about a quarter of the country, quarter of businesses that have been severely impacted by the pandemic. But then there's been about a quarter of the country and probably a quarter of businesses that have actually done better or are feeling that they're doing better. And so it's thinking about um, the public policy response to help those most affected and the public policy response that allows that opportunity to continue for those that have done well and are doing well, right? I, I think one of the best um, uh, descriptions of the coming economic stimulus is in fact that, you know, significant numbers of Canadians have been saving so much money. Um, and I think the minister, the federal minister of finance said it in her economic statement on Monday that the stimulus is already in people's bank's accounts once they're able to spend it, once we have a vaccine and we're comfortable going out again and listening to live music and getting on an airplane, that that money will start to flow and we'll see significant economic benefits. All of us are hoping when, and that's the big question I'll end with, is when is this vaccine coming? And we just released data today where we asked Canadians last week, when do you think an approved vaccine will be uh, available for you to personally get. And you can see Canadians aren't very clear. No one is really falling into any one group, right? About a, about a third of the country thinks that within the first quarter of the year or so, 
that vaccine might be available. Others are thinking it's going to be much later. But that hope of vaccine um, is really interesting. And I just want to share one last set of data with you. We, we started at the end of October because we realized how important mental health was, how important happiness is, not just to our day-to-day -day lives, but we've seen in, in places like Europe where they're starting to use it as a key metric for the health, not only of the economy, but of the country. What is Canada's collective happiness? So we, we ask Canadians on every survey we do now, on a scale from zero to 10, how happy are you? 10 being I am thrilled and delighted and zero if you're miserable and, and really, really unhappy. And so we have uh, six data points now where we can actually say what the collective happiness was. And the first one we did back at the end of October, we had an average across the country of 6.2. And we'll, on our website, we get into this if you're interested in methodology or, or more details about it. But interestingly, we've been tracking it. And so for the first three waves, we saw about the same number, right? This number shouldn't change from week to week all that much, unless something significant happens that would cause millions of people to feel either better or worse about kind of their state of, of, of happiness. But in, at the end of October, we saw a big spike. Now, going from six to seven is real and it's big, right, On, in terms of a survey. It's statistically significant. And then in, in, in November, we kind of saw a slight dip. And then as of yesterday, we're kind of back to where we started. Now, there's lots of theories that we can put out of what happened. There's no way we're going to be able to pr prove what happened. But there seems to be at least a correlation between announcements of viruses being effective and maybe on the verge of being approved. Even today, we had uh, news, I think, in the UK of one of the viruses being approved and, and maybe it's going to be starting to roll out in the UK recently. Um, you had then AstraZeneca in November. So all of these are saying, oh, the light at the end of the tunnel is coming. You saw this collective sense of improvement. And then, and I can't for sure say this is what caused the drop, but we learned, you know, last week that maybe we might have to wait or we're going to be, quote, second in line. Whether that's true or not is besides the point, but there was a narrative in the news about that. And so the point of this chart is first, Canadians are reacting. Our happiness is so much now, I think, tied to this pandemic and our deep desire to see us through it. I echo what so many of uh, the other um, uh, strong uh, voices said today on our, on our call that, and what this issue of Capital Magazine is all about is, you know, I've been studying public opinion for 10 years now. Uh, Canadians are resilient. Canadians live through winter every single year. We know how to get it done. And I think that despite some of the negative numbers I shared with you, that I'm seeing the optimism, I'm seeing the hopefulness and, and a sense that if any country can bounce back better, it's gonna be ours. And if any city can bounce back stronger and better, I know it's gonna be Ottawa. And so um, that's what the data is telling me and I'm gonna end on that positive note. So Suling, I'll hand that back to you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for sharing that fascinating information with us and your perspective from uh, which is so insightful and uh, we're very grateful for the contributions to the magazine and uh, to our business community and to our country. So I appreciate you being here today. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to Melanie Williams. Melanie is the VP at um, the Gordon Group. And the Gordon Group, as I said earlier, has been a longtime partner of ours with Capital Magazine. So I just wanted to turn it over to you, Melanie, to see how you feel about this issue um, and how we plan to move forward as well. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Suling. And uh, thank you, everyone. Um, for joining us here today. Um, as Suling mentioned, we, um, we have been uh, co-publishers with the Ottawa Board of Trade on Capital Magazine. It's been our honor and privilege to do that and we appreciate the trust uh, put in us to, to take on such a creative endeavor. Um, this is our 12th one and typically these launch events are filled with cocktails and canopies and we have a big turnout and it's a great networking event and all of that. So you know, just like everything else uh, with COVID and like everyone else on the planet, we've had to pivot and we've had to adjust. So we have done that. And um, I would just wanted to, to take a few moments to, uh, to just acknowledge and uh, extend our gratitude to a few of our key stakeholder groups. Um, it takes a, a village. <laughs> it takes a 
quite a few of us to to bring this all together and and work together to make it happen so this was a, a challenging uh time to get this one off the ground it was delayed a bit but as uh suling mentioned it was obvious what what the content had to be and then um so first off i'd like to to very much thank all of our editorial contributors um, as well as our interviewees, many of whom uh, joined us today. And uh, we're just very appreciative of your valuable time and your thought leadership and the insights and uh, honestly, often the, the comfort uh, that you've, you've given um, uh, us so that we could produce some, some, some articles that uh, I think our readers found very relevant and very helpful. So uh, thank you there, and uh, also thank you to our advertisers. Um, it's, we definitely need our advertisers uh, to financially support this publication. They're critical to its success and its ongoing success. And it's always fun to see who ends up showing up um, mm -hmm. with uh, sharing their profiles and stories, um, either through sponsor contents or ad, uh, ads. And that's always fun because the sponsor content this time around, people were sharing their stories of their resilience, of how they've had to pivot and so forth. And that is in itself helpful to others within the community. People get ideas on, on what they could do, for example. Also, of course, thank you to the Ottawa Board of Trade. And in particular, you, Su Ling and Leanne, you're there as well, for your ongoing um, you know, good nature and, and, and positive spirit in, in wanting to collaborate uh, with us to be so creative and strategic in, in not only nailing down the editorial, but all the scheduling and everything. It, it, things changed because we've had to do everything virtually. We're all working from home, various rooms with, with things cutting in and out and so forth. But thank you so much. Um, you know, it was, it was great uh, to pivot with you and uh, do this dance. And, and we're all very pleased with uh, the end result. Our creative convergence process means you know, we, we work together. The end result is always better. So uh, thank you there. And last but not least, thank you to the Gordon Group staff that worked uh, really hard and, and creatively on bringing this all together. It's, it's uh, there are various different aspects to this from, you know, selling the, the, the ads to managing the whole project and to doing the design, the writing, We've had freelance writers as well that are always wonderful to have them um, distribute the kinds of voices uh, within the magazine. So thank you there as well. Um, we really enjoyed uh, pulling together this COVID-centric issue with you. And uh, we look forward to the next one, which is going to be our women's issue. And um, I know we, we had a lot of wonderful women leaders on the front cover this time, but you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, like even down uh, south of the border, what's happened with the communications team down there. Um, it seems as though, um, you know, women, women uh, are rising to the occasion and taking up the challenge to, to help during these, these, these crazy times. So uh, yes, in the spring, we will be producing our women's issues. So uh, we, we hope we can get the same kind of uh, enthusiasm and buy-in from, from our audiences. So thank you very much. And all the best for everyone's continued health and safety and uh, all the best of the season to you as well. And thanks again to the other panelists. Wow, some, some really great uh, uh, sharing going on. So, so thank you. Thank you, Melanie. And uh, I just want to extend our gratitude as well to you and your team. Uh, we just loved working with you and your ability to pick up on what the priorities are for us from the business community perspective. And, uh, and it has been great. And we look forward to the next issue because we definitely have seen some strong leadership from women around the world during this pandemic, but we also know that there has been a disproportionate burden placed upon women as well and how we, uh, and how we address those issues as we move forward and grow and how Ottawa has an opportunity there. So we look forward to that issue and we're very grateful to all of our contributors and our sponsors because these are challenging times and they have allowed us to move forward with this project and we're very grateful. So to everyone, thank you for being here or if you're watching this afterward for watching the recording. And uh, once again, uh, hard copies are available and many of our members and contributors will receive those and our sponsors. But if you would like one, please get in touch with our office, but don't also check out the online version at capitalmag.ca. 
Okay, so we wish everyone a happy evening. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you again very, very soon. Good night. Okay. Thank you.